Why such a long wait? Let's get started. Another race for the world's greatest driver, Juan Manuel Fangio. Former world champion Jim Clark leapt into the lead. That's Clark's Lotus going like a bomb. And James Hunt is the world champion by just one single point. By being a racing driver, you are under risk all the time. And if you no longer go for a gap that exists, you're no longer a racing driver. And that is Michael Schumacher ahead, the world champion. To become a four-time world champion, Sebastian Vettel, Lewis Hamilton, champion of the world. That's for all the kids out there who dream the impossible. Max Verstappen is champion of the world. Hello and welcome back to F1 in Review, episode 24 of our 2023 season. We are still in the middle of the summer break, but we're back to discuss some of the events that happened at the tail end of the first half of the of the season so far. And I must admit, I am tired of waiting. I'm waiting to find something in the silly season off period that we're having that would pop out. But it seems like we've had most of the drama up until this point. And then I was expecting some big announcement from Red Bull. Maybe they're dropping Perez halfway through for someone else or or it's just something. But silly season hasn't really delivered in the summer break um, so far. Maybe it's just because Alpines had their, their drama already and um, they have nothing left to do over the summer as everyone goes off on their holidays, their mandatory um, holidays. Um, however, we do have as I say, a few things to talk discuss today, including McLaren's um, success and their upward trajectory, uh, the new qualifying rules, and uh, Daniel Ricciardo's return. So a lot to go through in this episode. And I'm joined by Angus as as usual. Unfortunately, Tom's not here um, today. He, he unfortunately has to be away, but he'll be back with us next week, I'm sure, to deliver his opinions on some of the things we're going to discuss in this episode. So shall we start with McLaren and their success? And I want to start, Angus, if I may, with Piastri, because I think it's fair to say that Piastri has had quite an upward trajectory this season. I haven't seen a rookie go from strength to strength for quite a while. And it's been refreshing to see someone jump into a car, maybe be a little bit behind the teammate, and now rising through. And thanks to his success in the last couple of races, he is is included um, leading a Formula One race. And he's got a podium under his belt. So Piastri, Angus, fulfilling expectations. Is he coming to challenge? Lando Norris's success in McLaren and if you were McLaren would you be keeping him around for a lot longer uh yes so Piastri definitely had an an upward trajectory hasn't he he's um he's really starting to show why Alpine and McLaren fought tooth and nail in the courts to try and acquire him as one of their drivers for this year and McLaren showing that their success and the money they spent in court is definitely being repaid because yes Piastri has managed to not only uh not only like start off quite solidly but also improve his performance as the season's gone on when the car was less effective his performances suffered a bit he was still struggling to get in the points but then as time's gone on and then this as this mclaren car has suddenly peaked and become very very uh very very fast he's managed to turn that into excellent results fourth and fifth at silverstone and hungary And then, like you said, leading the sprint race and getting on the podium in the sprint race at Spa a few weeks ago. And it's really shown, I think, a couple of things. Number one, how impressive it is considering the lack of testing the drivers get these days. One and a half days of testing before the season starts effectively, uh, before they have to go straight into it and they have to be an F1 driver, simply put. But also... It makes it Daniel Ricciardo's season last year look even worse because if this if this man who's a rookie can go up against Lando Norris and fare well like this, then how on earth did an experienced Grand Prix winner not manage to do the same and not have the same impact at the same team? Um, it it almost some people have been suggesting. 
I don't think this will be the case because I think Norris is an exceptional driver. At what point does Norris start to be superseded by Piastri and Piastri start to take the lead in terms of the team performance? Do you think that point is soon, Tristan, or do you think that would be too uh, premature to start having those discussions? That's a really good question, actually. And uh, certainly it's been bubbling now within the community and the McLaren community. Um, I think at the moment, certainly Piastri is still learning the way of the McLaren, if you'd like. And Norris is so embedded within the team that he's got that that upper hand. I, I can't see Piastri this season or even the next matching Norris on his consistency. When you when you look back through the races, I think what what we can see is Piastri certainly has turns of speed, but Norris's uh consistent pace gives him an overall edge. And that's part of the reason why um Piastri has has kind of yet to get onto the the podium in a full race uh, and by the reason why he's you know he's, he's finished in fourth and why perhaps he wasn't able to hold on to the back of um Norris in Silverstone you know there's those moments like that and you start thinking yeah okay so you you're pretty fast and then you just drop back a bit it's kind of if you'd like it's the Perez issue with Perez versus Verstappen Perez has turns of pace but Verstappen has that consistent pace and let's that's basically where the the comparison between Perez and Piastri uh, sort of end there because I think it's it's unfair to suggest that that Piastri should be matching Norris at the moment. I think what we've got at the moment is a learn a learned driver behind a driver that has a, a lot of pace and a lot of experience under his belt and I think what we will now see is them get quite close and I I think the ideal situation for McLaren is <laughs> Norris and Piastri swap a little bit here and there but overall Norris has the um so we say dominance within the race because they really want to keep Norris happy because it's I think it's not unreasonable to say that other teams have got their eye on that particular talent and certainly Red Bull would very much like to have Lando Norris within their team because I think he could actually do some incredible things within that Red Bull and seems to have the adaptability, right, to drive a car like um, the McLaren, which other drivers such as, you know, Daniel Ricciardo failed to. So it is an interesting one, though. How many, how long? I'm going to say, I'm going to say two seasons, this season, next season. And then I think we'll see Piastri matching more often Norris's pace. But to be fair, that it could push them both forward. And I, I do, I do wonder where, where Piastri will now get to, given he's got to try and match someone like Lando Norris. And maybe, you know, it's funny, we were at the beginning of the season laughing about how Piastri had picked the wrong team and ha, ha, I should have gone to Alpine hmm. after all. And I don't know about you, but maybe I was wrong. I was wrong. I shouldn't have laughed. Hmm. The McLaren had the, the pace the whole time, apparently. Yeah. He definitely picked the right team, doesn't he? he? Have you seen Alpine at the moment? They're a little bit, uh, a little bit under the weather, a little bit in crisis. So he's definitely, he's picked the right team for sure. And also, but like, but literally the fact that before Austria, you'd never seen this this performance increase uh, coming from uh, from McLaren. But it's here. It looks like it's here to stay as well. If we develop on that point, I think that. I was one who, they had their grand results at Silverstone, and I will admit, I came, I was on the podcast, and I said that I saw it being, not necessarily a flash in the pan, but probably a performance which would struggle to be repeated at a circuit which was very different to Silverstone. And we saw, didn't we, they just continued to excel, they were arguably even better than they were at Silverstone. And mm. it was a, a quite incredible uh repeat of the Silverstone performance and then they went to Spa again you're thinking well you know what probably more likely to be at the front of the field because they're the circuit's similar to Silverstone it's high speed it's low drag but wasn't the case again it wasn't the case they actually put up a fantastic performance I think they suffered a bit on race day that was clear. They just you probably saw how Landon Norris dropped through the field like a stone, and 
we'll never know what Piastri could have done if it weren't for that contentious collision at the opening corner. But I think it it, it shows that this there really is bright sparks for this McLaren team at the moment. Um, and we talk about Piastri and what it'll mean for him going forward. I think he'll have more opportunities to develop in that team and to show his undoubted pace because that car looks real good now. It looks, I'm not saying they're going to be catching Ferrari and Aston Martin in the Constructors' Championship, but that car looks real good and it looks like it's stable. It could, it could be fast on all sorts of circuits. Mm. And barring upgrades from other teams, he they could be in some serious contention for more points and we could be seeing Piastri on a race podium by the end of the year rather than just a sprint podium. Who knows? Yeah, I, I'm very hopeful, actually, this year. And given that, that McLaren's already been on the podium this year, I think it's safe to say that it's not outside of the reach. And I, I mean, I'm still gutted that we didn't get double podium in Silverstone, but that would have been that would have been too good to be true, I guess. Um, but you are right. The trajectory for McLaren is really interesting. And actually, I, I should declare that these statistics are not my own. They are from the Formula One uh, website themselves. But they talk about... Um, the uh, the qualifying pace for McLaren versus other other teams, and it's really interesting to note that when we were at Miami, McLaren was about a hundred and one and a hundred and two percent slower um, than Red Bull, and now now only seven well seven races or eight races later, they're now at a just just behind them at 100 and 100.025 percent which i know it doesn't sound like a lot right you're like oh hold on a minute you're talking about the difference of of 1.75 you know two percent slower but but that's a massive amount a huge amount it seems like they're basically point you know point one percent away so so it is incredible that they've gone from sort of 1.82 percent away from the top team to sort of well under that one percent, that zero point five percent mark, and 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 that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing that race pace really come into effect. That qualifying pace really come into effect in the fact that now we're seeing proper results. And that's the thing about Formula One. I think we forget Angus when we're when we're talking about the times. We say, oh, you know, they were they were miles behind. They were four tenths per second. And, you know, that's a blink of an eye. It's incredible that we we talk about such tiny times. So these percentages really matter. So they, McLaren's really come a long way, and I'm hoping that as their performance has come a long way, their drivers also match that as well. Because it is, it's been the first time I think for a while I've been properly hopeful for McLaren. So hopeful that I bought some of their merch. I, uh, I finally, <laughs> finally gave up, uh, gave him. I, I promised my partner. I said, I said to her that if if McLaren won. I would um a race this year. I would I'd finally buy some merch. I haven't, I haven't bought any McLaren merch since the Lewis Hamilton days and uh when I was wow. very small and um that doesn't fit me anymore. So I said, Do you know what? If they if they win, then I will um I'll buy some merch. But they haven't won yet, but I uh, instead I thought they would actually because of, of um the performances. I was like, Oh god, I might have to commit to this. But yeah, I actually finally bought a jumper in their sale. They had a sale on, so um I bought one of their the triple crown um, jumpers because it looked pretty cool, I think, in my mind. Um, but as we go from McLaren success and and Piastri's, I don't know, momentous um, first sort of podium, I guess, for the sprint race, hmm. we find ourselves sort dabbing. Of. Yeah, I know, sort of. Yeah, I, I guess it's a podium. Um, I'm not sure. I'm sure there's a F1 nerd out there that like, actually it's not a podium because uh, they don't stand on one. Um, but you know. He did pretty well. Um, uh, we dabble, uh, <laughs> we dabble in the world of of new qualifying rules and um and the new age of their format, which is as follows: it, it, you have to use the three sets of tires in the three different qualifying rounds, starting in Q one where you use the hard tire, Q two when you use the medium tire, and finally in the top ten shootout for the pole position you can use the soft tyre. Do you like the format, Angus, or is it a ch- unnecessary change to a tried and tested recipe? I'm I'm sceptical of it because I've always thought that one of the appeals of 
the qualifying format which we have which has been in place for 17 years now such as it, such as it's such has its success been that i think that there shouldn't be a need for too many tweaks and this is a tweak which i think is not necessarily needed because i've always liked the fact that in knockout qualifying you get those uh different tire choices you get teams who will perhaps take a gamble on in dry conditions this is would take a gamble on a certain type of tire believing that it would give them the best possible advantage when it came to certain phases of qualifying um and i think that prescribing a rule where you have to have a certain tire compound in a certain part of qualifying i'd say that gives a bit too much predictability is my initial thoughts on it i think that sure i get why they're well actually you know what i don't get why they're doing it did they explain the reasons for why they why 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 they did that why did that change yeah it's because different teams perform on different tires at different levels so it's very easy to right. set yourself up for the soft tire and do a, a one hit and it's not as easy to set yourself up maybe for the medium tires and and you know in the race you might you might see aston martin going oh we can't make these medium tires work or you might see red bull saying oh god these soft tires are degraded too quickly or whatever basically it forces the teams to have to try and use at some point a tire when it matters and the other advantage is you it means that you can keep soft tires back as well so if for example you're williams (laughs) you may well have to use your soft tyre to get through, but that leaves you without soft tyres later on in the race, whereas Red Bull may be able to use a single set of soft tyres and then a single set of soft tyres in the in Q2 and then, you know, then another one in Q3 and then be left with more tyres than Williams, which perhaps had to use two sets of soft tyres in Q1 as two sets in Q2 and then, you know, maybe failing to get into Q3. So it, it, it levels out the playing field by making sure that everyone has to use the same compounds of tyres, which leaves them with perhaps more tyres. If you are if you get out in Q1, you're then left with more tyres for um, the uh, actual race. So you'd be left with more softs, for example. It also means that you have to then balance out your setup so you can engage with all tyres as well. So it basically encourages teams to be more, like, what's the word, flexible or sort of yeah, look at setup changes more. Okay. It does, and it does benefit somewhat more the, the lower teams, um, or the teams at the back, because it, doesn't, it means they, they don't have to burn through loads of their soft tyres to try and remain competitive because they hate they have to use the hards supposedly i don't know if you yeah. believe that or not but yeah i don't know i feel like for me an f1 fan is just going to look at that and go oh well they're all on the same tyre where's the variety gone that's that's how i how i see it. i don't think it's necessarily the most inspiring rule you could you could have um or the biggest rule change and because they had it for, they tried it just for one race. Do we know if there's plans for them to try it again this season, or is it just like a one-off thing that they're exploring? I don't think they're using it for the rest of the races, but yeah, we'll we'll have to we'll have to wait and see whether or not they they, they think it affected it in a positive way. But it is certainly going to be interesting to see whether or not it, it does cut down on tire usage, because that is the aim of the game, isn't it? Really, for at the moment to to try and reduce the the tire waste. Um, do you think this will actually have a measurable impact on reducing tyre usage? It's hard to tell. And also, the, the it's interesting you talk about the tyre waste because I reckon that fits in with the uh, the zero the zero emissions policy they're going down, the carbon neutral aim by, is it 2028 or 2030? Mm. Um, that fits with that remit. So tyre usage, I think that, well, surely one way to improved tyre usage would be to give the teams more tyres um, if that's not too obvious a, a solution but I know that for Pirelli to constantly produce tyres is quite a laborious task and also is something which you know over the years teams have been criticised for using too many tyres and the fact, I remember when Pirelli first came in part of the uh, 
the whole point of the the rule uh, with tyres is that teams had to be uh, quite uh, frugal with their tyres, I suppose you could say, because especially in the days when you had the um, the rotten egg tyres or the chewing gum tyres, which would just degrade after five laps, teams had to be really canny with how they used them. Um, so again, I get I get from that point of view why it may have been an initiative that they wanted to use, but I can't say that I'm uh, enamoured by it, shall we say. I can't say that it's uh, something which is really sort of catching my attention, but I'm interested to see where it will go anyhow. Um, to be honest, we all know that Maxi Boy Verstappen is going to get pole regardless of whether... Uh, they have to be on the same tyres, different tyres, or whether they literally do make them drive on bits of chewing gum. Uh, I still think you get pole position if that was the case. But uh, it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see how the how the rule change possibly affects parts of the pecking order. Yeah, well, we'll see. Uh, especially in Monza, so Monza will be the second test for this, so <laughs> we will be able to experience it again uh, at a completely different style of track from Hungary. Um, I'm very actually I'm very excited for 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 Monza, but I'm I'm hoping this doesn't really screw over Williams because this could be their moment to shine with their super slippery rocket ship torpedo car that they seems to have uh, seem to have designed, which which kind of flourished for a while, didn't it? At um at Spa, and then they degraded their tires way too quickly, and then they were back to <laughs> back to falling back. But for a while. Whilst they had good tyres, they were absolutely storming through. So I'm very excited for Monza. So we'll, well, I guess we'll maybe William's successor, hopefully. And also, uh, we'll be able to check in again with the success of this new qualifying format. And if I'm honest, I think it's more of a gimmick than anything else. Um, especially as you, you really have to be paying attention to whether or not these changes are coming in and what's going on. If you're a casual fan... I don't know whether or not this has any purpose. And I'd like to highlight that most of the emissions in F1 does not come from the production of tyres or the burning of fuel. It comes from sheer logistics of the the transportation, setting up the trucks to get the cars where they need to be. And of course, let's not forget the 10,000 or so people that arrive every day to witness the sport. And so I, I find it a little bit weird that they have these strange lines in the sand. So they say, oh, yeah, well, we are we want to cut tyre usage, so we're going to try a new qualifying. Yeah. Also, yeah. we're going to now go halfway across the world from Europe. Why? Because we like Canada being there in the season. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, they do like three Europe races, and then we off we go to Miami or whatever, or the, you know the yeah. brand new oil partnership or something like that. I don't know. I find it a bit, a bit weird. It's like you know, it's just, it's just completely backwards to me that they have these, as I say, these like lines in the sand. Oh, we have to be careful about tire usage, and now also let's continue to air freight our our cars around um, the world. That, that does a lot of damage. And also, let's not forget as well, the use of private jets. So private jets have a, a massive yep. environmental impact. Well, you could, I, I, in my mind, it makes way more sense for someone like Red Bull to charter a commercial jet, and which you can do, by the way, and put their whole team on it and basically send them that way rather than Lando Norris and Max Verstappen arriving in Max Force One, as it's called. And things like that. I don't know. There are there are lots of other ways, everyday ways that I think they could make a much bigger impact on the sport. Like you know, having electric buses transport to tracks from uh, central public transport locations. Oh, that'd be good. I think the Dutch have actually they've done that already, and it's it looks really good. So yeah, I, I find it really weird, Angus, that they they they're like, oh yeah, well we want to use two less tires a weekend, but also let's uh, continue with you know helicopter helicopter usage and private jet usage i don't know it's just it's the wrong messages i think yeah what's uh what what's uh more carbon neutral to f1 producing less tires or having back-to-back races in azerbaijan and miami i wonder yeah i know um but i i you know i i, I guess it doesn't answer the question whether we really like it though i found it fine if if, if i'm honest as, as we yeah. route back to the original question i thought it was fine it i don't think it actually mixed up the order at all because everyone has to use the same tyres. I, I think that, you know, there might have been a little bit um, 
yeah, a little bit of the the oh, we can't get started on the hard tire, maybe, and especially if it's if it's slightly damp, I think then everyone being on the hard tire um, might be quite interesting. But yeah, I guess we'll find out once we once we try it again in Monza. So for the moment, it's it's sort of a watching brief for this one. But I do think we're just going to go back to the normal format. Um, at, you know, going forward because I don't think it's going to make the impact they want. No, I'd have to agree with you there. As we move on from the new qualifying rules, we could, I think it's a good moment halfway through the season to discuss the Ferrari Aston Martin fight, which is currently going on for the battle of third in the World Constructors Championship. Aston Martin, I think it's fair to say, had an absolutely flying start. Whilst not as good as the Red Bull car they certainly were above the rest of the pack if you if you if you like i um aston martin were formula 1.25 whereas everyone else's were formula 1.5 but as the season's gone on i think it's fair to say that aston martin's fallen back um in the points and they are now being challenged by ferrari for third place having lost second place to mercedes so angus do you think ferrari are going to overtake there um, their their rivals at Aston Martin, and what's this going to do for people like Lance Stroll and uh, Fernando Alonso, who were hoping this season would, was going to be a, a real turnaround point for their careers, and certainly, you know, for um, Fernando Alonso's, he wanted this moment to shine again back in the spotlight. Now, I'm going to answer your first question: Do I think that Ferrari will overtake Aston Martin? I do think they will eventually, just because. There's more momentum with them and I can see, whilst I can see Aston Martin sort of not middling out, but sort of like phasing out and towards a team which is more consistently in the lower end of the points rather than having the the peaks that I expect Ferrari to have. I can, I can see Ferrari having the odd, uh, the odd podium or... Uh, or maybe even who knows not well not a race win probably but if they I can see like Leclerc being up there and then picking up the pieces if Red Bull encounter a problem whilst Aston Martin I can sort of see them yeah going along at a sort of a decent rate getting the few points like they picked up I mean in in Spa once again didn't have a bad race they picked up 12 points for fifth and ninth you know a decent little uh decent little haul as well as uh and when you compare that to Ferrari picking up 19 points, so 15 for the podium for Leclerc and then fifth in the sprint race, not too bad. But, and call me hyperbolic here, hyperbolic, whatever, how you, however you want to pronounce it, but Aston Martin will lose out on that third because they only have one driver. Oh. Yeah, it's oh. harsh, but it's harsh, but to be honest with you, it's proving more and more true as the weeks go on. Stroll is just not picking up any sort of strong results recently. He's not doing as well as he could do. He hasn't finished above ninth in the last four races, if bar the, the sprint race in Austria where he came fourth, to be fair. So that's not too bad. But Alonso still got two top five finishes in that time, a top five in the sprint as well. He's just delivering more than his uh, Canadian teammate. And um, Ferrari have got... <coughs> Ferrari have got at least a better combination, and that Leclerc <clears throat> more likely to pick up those sort of those highs, like I say, uh, and be the one sort of have a pole. Like he got pole in uh, what do you call it in Spa by virtue of admittedly being second and then being promoted to first when Verstappen was demoted because of his engine penalty. But still, he was there to pick up that place, and then you got Carlos Sainz who actually. Has uh, of eight drivers this season to have stood on the podium, he is quite surprisingly, I'd say, not one of them. But he has managed to finish in the top five on four, uh, one, two, three, four, five occasions. I just have to count quickly. Finished in the top five on five occasions. He's got three top fives in a sprint as well. So he's sort of collating points at a decent rate, a consistent rate. He's got 92 to Leclerc's 99 in the, in the drivers' championship. But Stroll, or to give him his actual name, Lance Strulevich, fun fact, um, <laughs> actually. has not. Yeah, yeah, genuinely, it's on That's Wikipedia. Um, he's just not been picking up the points as well as Alonso has, and 
I think that in the end that's going to be the thing which holds them back and means that they don't quite achieve that third place. But I would still like to emphasise, to conclude my sort of spiel on this, even if Aston Martin were to pick up fourth place in the Constructors, that is a fantastic achievement, considering last season they were behind Alfa and Mayo, and also two two teams who they've considerably leapfrogged above across the season in McLaren and Alpine, despite McLaren's recent purple patch, which has taken them above Aston Martin in the, the pecking order. Despite that, their season has to be commended because they already have something like three times the amount of points they got last season and we're only just halfway through the season. So whatever you think of whether they'll get third or not, I think their season will go down as, as a success at the end of it based on simply the start they've had so far and possibly the finish that they may obtain. I'm not sure they necessarily should be commended. This is the tricky bit, isn't it? Because it... Yes, it's a massive, great movement they've had. But let's be fair, they, they're they not doing brilliantly now in comparison to where they were at the beginning of the season. And I think that's only really the measure you can have. I mean, by comparison, right, let's take, let's take McLaren. Right, they've had 74 points in the last three races. That's part of the reason why they've moved wow. up so, that's so crazy. far. And then if you check, if you look at Aston Martin's record for the last three races, they've only had 21. Mm, big slip down. But <laughs> those points don't lie. And my concern now is if McLaren keep up the pace, McLaren is only, only 93 points behind Aston Martin as we enter mm. into the second half of the season. There is a real threat that McLaren could continue this upward trajectory and overtake Aston Martin and we're leaving them in fifth place. Do you think McLaren will catch Aston Martin? You talk about the uh, ability for them to, if they keep up the current rate, I think, well, if they keep up the current rate, they'd overtake them within six races or so. Do you think they'll actually overtake them? Or do you see the, I think I see the rate slowing down if the the current, let's say the current pace uh, levels... Uh, are kept up, but do you think they'll be? Do you think they'll be caught? We've got nine races left, and there is ninety three points between the teams. So between McLaren and um, Aston Martin. So yeah, I think so. I think I think six races they will be just behind them, and then they will look. Yeah, so they would have caught them in about six races, and I reckon it will be a three race sprint to the end to try and get over the line and beat Aston Martin. And so, yeah, it might well come down to the last race, but with with nine races left, absolutely, I think we could see McLaren keeping up that momentum. And I think part of that is because McLaren's just brought this extra pace out and Aston Martin seems to have been I don't know. I don't. I don't what's the opposite of an upgrade? <laughs> De upgrading the car? I'm not sure. But then just not making the aero package work, and then we start bringing back old designs and old formulas. It's not looking good for them at the moment, and it's not just me that's noticed this either. This is, you know, this has now been well documented across the F1 journalistic spectrum. The fact that the Aston Martin are just not making it work, especially as other teams are innovating in in new ways. And and not only looking at Red Bull and what they've done, but also pairing that with their own upgrades to make it work in a in a in a better fashion. And I think there was something that made me chuckle actually when I was I was reading it, and um, that was Mercedes's upgrades. Right, they started off with those side pods, but now they've been nicknamed the Franken pods because we they've got this like Frankenstein combination of the sort of Red Bull, their own design ethos and a few other bits nicked from like Alpine as well thrown in there. But the point is that they've right. got their own design ethos and they're making everything else work with it to to you know to pinch the good parts. I feel like what Aston Martin's got is it it's got Red Bull's original design and then they've kind of kind of mashed it into a direction, but because they didn't necessarily have the full picture of why Red Bull went with that design in the first place. They're just not making it work. Whereas every other team, I think, had their own original design ethos, understand what their strengths of their car are, 
and then are sort of Frankensteinly putting everything else together to create their own monster that can challenge the Red Bull dominance. Just a bunch of Frankenstein monsters is their fun cars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly i'm not sure if that analogy was successful or not um but speaking of success we finally move on to our last topic of the podcast you may be relieved to hear which is daniel ricardo daniel rather ah, rather famously i think across the f1 um <laughs> reporting replaced poor nick de Vries, who was unceremoniously wheeled out of the alpha tauri team and swiftly ejected into i think the Mercedes pool of misfit drivers. Uh, Toto Wolf, I think, has now got him under his wing, along with Mick Schumacher and everyone else who um <laughs> who's been ejected out of the team. Um, but all eyes were on Daniel Ricciardo as he made his debuts. Would you say, looking at his performance across the last couple of races, he's met your expectations, Angus? His re-debut, I think you mean. I think that's what we're going to have to have to call it oh it's, it's funny isn't it how it's been 12 years since he he made his uh his first appearance in formula one halfway through a season for a team that was at the back of the grid uh that time it was hispania racing or hrt as they as they used to be called and this time he's made made a, a return for a team at the back of the grid halfway through a season history's repeating itself um which is very funny but also has he met my expectations? I think yes, because I didn't expect him to necessarily make waves. Um, I remember saying a few weeks ago on this podcast that for anyone thinking that he'd be breaching the points at some point during the season, I think would have to be left disappointed because of just the pace of that car and the fact that Yuki Tsunoda, having only been in the points on... What three occasions this season? He got he got a point in a uh, Spa. I'm sure, we'll get on to him in a minute. So I'll save my thoughts on him for then. But um, yeah, in terms of Ricardo, did he meet my expectations? Has he so far? Yeah, probably because he managed to didn't he? He out qualified Sonoda in the sprint shootout. Checks notes. Yes, he did. Um, so that was a nice little uh, nice little fillet for a li- nice little feather to put in his cap in the the second race, but. In terms of race pace, I think that's the thing. That's the one which Ricardo is probably more more rusty with. We saw that in in Spa, how he was. Well, Sonoda was at one point flirting with the the top six or top seven, such as the strong start to his race. Um, Ricardo was never really in the picture for points, and I think that is the thing which he will probably admit himself is what he has to improve on. It's the race pace and that ability to construct a race and bring out the best of that car whatever that might be um even if that is an 11th or 12th place finish at maximum so he's done all right so far i think half a season to judge him based on this he doesn't get back in the red bull team like everyone's been uh pining for but yeah he's made he's made an all right start he's done all right i suppose hasn't he <laughs> he's done he has done all right hasn't he um but saying that important to note is he is actually 21st in the driver standing so He's not beaten Nick De Vries yet. I'm not sure if that influences your um, opinion at all, but it was funny, really, that I think everyone was very forgiving for Ricardo, isn't he? Every, you know, oh, bless him. He's just doing his best. And then Nick De Vries doesn't do great. And I was like, ugh, go, ugh, Nick, ugh, move out of the way, get another driver in. So perhaps it's, a, it's, a, it's another matter of, of F1 favoritism within the fan base, which we are all too familiar with. I've been relatively impressed by Daniel Ricciardo. I think certainly, if I, I think he's a better fit, right, for, for Alpha Tauri and where they are at the moment. And he did have an opportunity, didn't he, um, to to uh, to really show off why they brought back. But, you know, I think a bit of bad luck meant that, you know, he, unfortunately, he did have to give up the points that he so rightfully deserved. Um, but it's been a, it's been a, a bit of a embarrassing, um, saga, hasn't it? For the whole Red Bull franchise, having to sort of shoehorn Nick De Vries in as he, after he demonstrated success at Williams last year in that sort of one hit debut, um, and then having to throw him out for a driver that has been rejected by McLaren and famously paid off to, to leave the contract early. 
Um, and then for him to come in and then oh, through a mixture of bad luck and, and also just not necessarily being as fast, falling behind Yuki Sonoda and also now being behind Nick DeVries. I mean, in the dream world, he would have come in and then got a point. And then sh- shot up the the standings and demonstrated why he's done so well. So I think this has been really messy. The whole thing has been really messy, and I think that's really tarnished the brand of AlphaTauri for a bit. Um, and also Red Bull. It's not like when they got rid of Daniel Kvyat and then Max Verstappen took over that seat and his debut race in Spain won, and everyone went ah, fair enough then. <laughs> they sort of shut everyone down. This is this is a bit different, isn't it? This is this is I, I would say if if nepotism was a thing or could be a thing in F1 within the Red Bull family, this is close as it's gonna be, isn't it, really? And so I think in the eyes of Red Bull and Alpha Tauri, Ricardo's never gonna do any wrong, no matter where he finishes. And in the eyes of the fans, I think that's also true. But what I will say is if Daniel Ricciardo doesn't score any points at the end of this season, it's going to leave AlphaTauri and Red Bull looking rather embarrassed. Yep, I think that's fair. And also we've we've discussed before, haven't we, how unfair it would be on um, someone like Yuki Tsunoda were, were he to be leapfrogged in the pecking order by Daniel Ricciardo. I suppose if we just touch on Tsunoda's race um, in Spa, because like I said, it was quite it was a good race and it was... Uh, a strong race from him. It almost looked at one point when when you had um, when you had Russell a bit further down the field, and you had uh, a couple of drivers such as Norris and Ocon, whose strategies kind of played out uh, more favourably as the race went on. At, the, at one point, you had Sonoda and Albon having a battle for sixth place, didn't you? With uh, the the deficiencies of the Williams car being made up for by the the dynamite straight line speed that it has. But you also had Sonoda up there. And having a strong race, admittedly took advantage of a few things, mainly uh, Science and Piastri uh, terminating their own races early doors. Um, but it was yes, I thought Sonoda put up a good account of himself in um, in Spa, and for realistically, that Alpha Tauri to get tenth place is a good result, and considering it's only the third tenth place they've got all season, it probably shows. And reflects well on the team, to be honest with you. Um, interesting to note that Red Bull possibly on course for their best ever season in terms of points, with over 500 already, which is eye-watering. Whilst Alpha Tower at the other end have uh, have just the three points to their name and could be on for by far their worst season ever. Um, but back to Sonoda, yeah, he... Um, I don't know about you, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts, but I thought Sonoda had a, uh, a very nice a very nice race, a comm- commendable race. In the uh, uh, the encounter in Spa a few weeks ago, what do you think? Shoots of shoots shoots of growth. Yes, it was it was pretty good from Sonia. Their battle between um, him and Alex Albon and it was was very exciting actually, and it was really good to see Sonoda sort of I say living up to the expectations from a driver, even though the the the, the team itself, the the car itself, is quite slow. But I think it was nice to see him doing some wheel to wheel racing as much as. Um, Alex Albon in that Williams was doing his best to to hold on um, in front, so I think this is going to push Sonoda forwards, and Ricardo in the in the team as well will will help with that. So I think we've got some you know relatively good um, shoots, green shoots if you like, some purple patches coming from Alva Alva Tauri and they can push forwards, but it's certainly a, a problem car and. Next year, the Red Bull Red Bull team is going to bring them way back under the wing and direct them forward. So I think that's the long game here for Ricardo. I think he's just got to get through the, the rest of the series um, of F1 and the last nine races and accept that next year he's going to basically be in a slightly lower division Red Bull car that's going to be way more competitive. It's a shame, really, isn't it, that they're no longer a sister team, but... I feel like to some extent Nick De Vries exiting is, is sort of a symptom of, of that junior um where that junior team actually is in and what Red Bull want it to be. It isn't a training ground anymore necessarily for the up and coming drivers. They want it to be a second sister team that's just as competitive, which means they're gonna be just as ruthless and there is no time 
in that for for uh, apparently a, a you know sort of a an older driver that's had their their shot. So get rid of Nick DeVries, put in a, a known quantity, and get that AlphaTauri car. If it's still called AlphaTauri, that may well um, that particular sponsorship may well be over. Um, but bring that back up to where it used to be as well. So yeah, it's uh, maybe they'll be back to, to Toro Rosso, perhaps um, Angus or or another clothing brand. But yeah, back to the Toro Rosso days, back to the Daniel Ricciardo days. It's a real boomerang for a team that I think for a while we were all calling a sister team. Yeah, and also a um, a boomerang for a team that I remember they used to they used to be a back of the grid team, didn't they? They used to be about sort of. Eighth, ninth place in the constructors' championship. Never absolutely plumb last, but they used to be low down. And then for a few years, they were really punching above their weight with um, with Verstappen in science when the, in, when they first came to Formula One, and then Gasly kind of took on the mantle of punching above their their weight. I mean, Gasly got what was it two podiums in the end in an Alpha Tauri, which is quite a, quite an astonishing uh, feat, really, including a race win. And they became known as the plucky underdogs, but. They really have sort of dropped like a stone. I think Gasly being there last season masked the fact that they were dropping because he was still able to drag that car to some strong positions and get some good points. And Sonoda to a certain extent as well. But I think now they really are dropping down and coinciding, having the line up with their, their worst season in terms of the car performance. And... Uh, they're, they're definitely, if we were to do a big mid-season review episode, I think we'd give them a low score, wouldn't we, and say they are the ones with room for improvement. And so ends episode 24 of F1 in Review. Thank you very much if you've got to the end of the podcast so far. Next week will be a slight return to usual as Tom takes over the helm to direct the podcast as we go through the, the next set of topics in preparation, I think, for the end of the summer break as we head back towards f1 i don't know about you but i cannot wait for the next race which will be taking place in monza finally we get to go to italy after the last italian race was unfortunately cancelled so fingers crossed eh, for the for the weather turning um it's a favorable eye towards a track which could promise so much for certain teams that have been waiting for high speed opportunity to show off um, their particular strengths of their car but until next week thank you very much for listening and of course, you can follow us on X, follow uh, formerly Twitter, if it's still called X by the time you're listening to this, as well as TikTok, where you can hear shorts of our um, our podcast, just in case you don't have time to catch the full hour. And please don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you are listening on. It goes a long way to continue promoting us as we continue to grow through the community. And in the meantime, if you have any comments or fancy feeding into the conversation, you can do so on our social media platforms. Have a wonderful week and we'll catch you next week.